An elephant trainer came to see the Buddha one time. And after listening to the teachings, he said, Elephants are easy, human beings are hard. Elephants don't have that many tricks, that many ways of being disobedient. But human beings are very complex. We're talking about the mind being like a committee. Sometimes it seems like it's too small an image. It's more like a crowd. And lots of people in the crowd have different different agendas. So as you're meditating, you have to realize that even though part of the mind is with the breath, the other parts that don't want to be with the breath. And they'll do what they can to sabotage the concentration you've got going. So you've got to be very careful. On the one hand, it means you have to look after the concentration very carefully. Because in the beginning, it's going to be very fragile. And secondly, you've got to learn how to deal with those different members. Sometimes you can simply push them aside. And other times you have to look at them. Where are they coming from? I know when I first started meditating, I had all these voices in my mind saying that I shouldn't be doing this, that it was selfish, that it was whatever. And I began to track down, where did those voices come from? Some were from opinions I'd learned from my parents, some from my teachers, some from the media, some from friends, from school. And the question I had to keep asking is, what do they know? As compared to the Buddha. Of course, part of the mind was wondering, well, what did the Buddha know? After all, he lived a long time ago. Society wasn't as advanced then as it was now. And those are things that the different members of the committee can say. But you have to keep looking at the possibility that Buddha said it is possible to put an end to suffering thoroughly. And there should be at least one part of the mind that's determined to see that through, see if it really is possible. That's the part you've got to nurture. As for other ones, as I said, sometimes you push them aside, sometimes you have to investigate them. Where are they coming from? Where would they go? If you followed a particular line of thought, where would it lead you? Do you really want to identify with that? Other ways you can deal with it are basically to find a meditation topic that you find interesting. One of the reasons I liked the John Lee method was because it made the breath interesting. Prior to that, it was just in, out, in, out, in, out, and especially when they told you not to adjust it, not to make any changes, just be with the breath as it was. got pretty boring. And you began to wonder what it was accomplishing. Whereas when you're working with the breath, at the very least, if concentration isn't really great, at least you can say, I'm at least working with getting acquainted with the body, how the body feels from within. Getting the breath energy to flow a little bit better should be good for that, my health. In other words, you're not here to get concentration so much. You're here to learn about the breath. The concentration will come without you having to think about it. If the topic is interesting, if the theme is interesting, you don't have to worry about whether you're getting into the first jhana or whatever. You're learning about the topic. And that's one way to win some of those voices over to your side. Then, of course, they're the ones who say, oh, your concentration is miserable. Why even try? But you have to remember, where does good concentration come from? It comes from mediocre concentration, even from miserable concentration. The fact that you have some concentration is the seed. You learn how to nurture that. Even though the seed doesn't seem 
ready to sprout quite yet. Just keep watering it, looking after it. And have that attitude that every little bit of something good has to be good. So watch out for the voices that tend to undercut your efforts are hypocritical about them. They're not your friends. They may be they may sound like they're speaking with the voice of the Dharma. You know that old saying about how the devil can quote scripture to his purpose. Well the defilements can quote Dharma for their purpose. So don't be fooled by them. And remember that this is a long-term process. We talk a lot about heedfulness, about being ready to die at any point. But the thing about death is if you're dying in the process of practicing, that gives you a kind of a momentum. That bodes well for where you're going. Much better than if you just give up. That doesn't bode well for anything at all. So take stock of the fact that your mind is complex, and it's many minds. You get one mind to be concentrated for a while, and you find, oh, there's another mind that wants to destroy it. Another mind that's indifferent. There are lots of different minds in there. The more of them that you can convert, the more that you can understand. the better off you'll be. This is why concentration meditation is a long-term project. You'll be dealing with many different voices inside, and you have to learn the right technique for dealing with each other. You can't say, well, I'm just going to deal with greed as one big defilement and take care of all forms of greed all at once. Greed comes in many different ways. Anger comes in many different ways. Delusion comes in many different forms. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with them all. Now, after all, in some cases, once you've dealt with one, it'll be easier to deal with another. But there are other cases where it takes on an entirely new form, and you've got to figure out it's the fact that it's coming from a different angle. And so you need to have the kind of patience that sees things through, not the patience that says, well, however long it takes, I don't care and then give up. That's not really patience. You want the patience that keeps at it, keeps at it, keeps at it, and keep nourishing itself. Learning how to use your heedfulness in the right way. The heedfulness that says, I've got to get things done right away, has its place. But the heedfulness that says, I've got to do these things carefully if I want to do them well. It may take time. That has its place, too. So that even though your mind is a lot more complex than an elephant, it doesn't mean that it's beyond your capacity to deal with. Simply that it's you've got to realize the complexity is there, the many ins and outs, the many identities your mind takes on. Are there not as an obstacle, think of them more as a challenge, and that you're up for the challenge. One of John Munn's talks, toward the end of his life, he compared meditation to a battle. And the different qualities you need in meditation were the different weapons and the food that the soldier needs. But the soldier is that determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of your defilements ever again. And it's also the determination to make sure that you're up for that, that you really believe that you can do it. Without that confidence, the soldier's going to get nowhere.
So keep working on your confidence. That no matter how intricate and complicated the mind may be, it is a puzzle that can be solved.